Self-talk and visualization are the two keys to my success. I believed for that last time, 19 miles, I was indestructible. Um, what happened, I, I came home one night from work spraying for cockroaches. And um, long story short, I turned on the, the um, Discovery Channel. I saw some guys going through Navy SEAL training and they were going through Hell Week and they were getting their ass just beat. You know, in and out of the water, guys ringing the bell. Um, they were just suffering. And I was weighing like 297 pounds. And I had to make a change in my life. You know, I was at an all time low and I wasn't going anywhere. And I was exactly what everybody said I was gonna be, which was nothing. So I had to make a change. Well, for me, growing up, I came from a horrible background. I got called nigger every day of my life growing up, um, lived in a small town. The Klan headquarters at that time was about um, 20 minutes from where I lived. The, uh, one of the high ups in the KKK, son, sat behind me in two classes, so he called me nigger all the time. Got my first car, they spray printed nigger, we're gonna kill you on it. So I was just an insecure, scared kid. And the only way I could find myself was to put myself through the worst thing possible. Every day, we're seeing who we are as people. When I was growing up, I, I lied for people to accept me because I didn't accept myself. So I would make up stories so, so that you would accept me into your world. I would, uh, everything I did was for someone else to like me. It wasn't until I started reading my own book about how pathetic I was as a human being. I could blame my dad, I can blame kids at school, I could blame having health issues, ADD, my mom not being around. Great mom, but she was doing her thing. Nice. I could blame a lot of people. And that's the book I was reading. And I put it off on everybody else. It wasn't until I said, you know what, for me to fix this, I gotta read what the hell, what the f is wrong with David Goggins? Not, not blame anybody. Read my book and say, okay, I'm afraid of my shadow. How can I overcome that? Go in the military, get your ass kicked, do things you hate to do. Be uncomfortable every fucking day of your life. Roger that. I'm not the smartest kid in the world. Okay. Instead of somebody saying, oh no, you're smart. No, no, don't say that to yourself. I said to myself, no, I'm a dumb motherfucker. Okay, roger that. How you get smarter? Educate yourself. So the things that we run from, we run from the truth. We're running from the truth, man. So the only way I became successful was going towards the truth. As painful and as brutal as it is, it changed me. It, it allowed me to become, in my own right, who I am today. I go on to want to raise money for families. All these guys died, they all had kids. I want to raise money for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. It's a foundation where 100% tuition goes to these kids to go to college, you know, full tuition, whatever. So I found this great foundation. I'm going to raise money for it. So I said, you know what? I have to Google something that's, that's evil, something very hard. I knew nothing about ultra marathons. I hadn't even run a marathon. I knew nothing about this world. So I Googled the, you know, the top 10 hardest races in the world. And what comes up is a bad water 135. It's a 135 mile race through Death Valley in the summertime. I thought it was a stage race. I thought it was a race where you run like 20 miles, set up camp, you know, barbecue outside, and then go run some more the next day. So I called the race director up at the race and said, hey, Chris, his name is Chris Costman. I want to do your race. So we had a long conversation. You know, I was, I was much heavier then, and I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. I'm around between 240 to 270. I'm in there, I'm in that range. Cause I've, my, my weight has varied a lot through the SEAL teams and out of the sure. SEAL teams, so I was a heavy guy. But the long and short of it all was, I hadn't put running shoes on in over a year. I was a big time power lifter. I lifted weights heavy, that's what I did. Right. I just got back home from Iraq, went straight to free fall school, and then this happened. So I called Chris Costman up on a Wednesday. He says, look man, the only way you can qualify for my race is to run 100 miles at one time in 24 hours or less. There happened to be a race that Saturday, so four days later. And he said, if you qualify by running 100 miles or less in 24 hours, I will consider you my race. 
I signed up for this race. It was called the San Diego One Day, where you run around a one mile track for 24 hours to see how many miles you can get. My goal was 100 miles. So um, I got to mile 70 and I cleared 70 miles in like 12, 13 hours pretty quickly, but I was done. My feet were broken. I was stretch fractures, shin splints, muscles were tearing. I was in bad shape. No water, didn't know what the hell I was doing out there. Had on some tube socks. It was just ridiculous. It was, it was a clown show. So I sat down at mile 70 and at this time I was married. And I, I look at my wife and I was like, um, I'm, I'm messed up bad. So I literally start to turn white. And when a black guy turns white, you're pretty <laughs> up. I'm all up in this chair. I'm at mile 70, they got 30 miles to go. I'm jacked up. I got to go to the bathroom. And the bathroom's like 20 feet from me, it's a porta potty. I can't get out of the chair. So I'm peeing blood down my leg, pooping up my pack, and I got 30 miles to go. And I'm, I can't stand up because my, my blood pressure's all messed up. I've been in three hell weeks, ranger school, overcome so many obstacles in my life. This last 30 miles of this race is when I realized a human being is not so human anymore. We have the ability to go in such a space if you're willing to suffer, and I mean suffer, your brain and your body once connected together can do anything. And this 30 miles was the life-changing moment. I was out of it. I was in the worst pain in my entire life. I was, to me, on the brink of death. And I was able to chunk this 30 damn miles into small pieces. I was so driven. When you're driven, whatever's in front of you will get destroyed. So I sat in this chair and I was so driven to succeed in this race. And, it, and at this time, everybody goes, were you thinking about the guys that died? And I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't. This became a personal thing. This became me against this race, me against the kids that called me nigger, me against me. It, it, it just became something that I took so, so violently personal. And I broke this thing down into small pieces. I said, okay, I gotta get nutrition. I gotta be able to stand up before I can get off this curb and get off this chair and be able to go 30 miles. So I went through all these small steps and I, I was able to stand up. And then from standing up, I was literally walking around with my wife at the time and she goes, you're not gonna make the time. She goes, you're, I mean, you're, you're walking like 30 some minute miles. I got to mile 81. And the second she said that I'm not gonna make the time, I ran the last 19 miles nonstop. My shins hurt so bad from having stretch fractures that the only way I could continue on Whoa. was I taped it so I wasn't doing the flexor motion that, that mm -hmm. activates your, your shins. So I taped my ankles and my shins up and I got that from, because in my third hell week, they weren't gonna let me go back through, you know, train anymore. Right. So I literally went through all of Bud's, my last SEAL training with stretch fractures and shin splints. And how I did it was I would tape my ankles all the way up to my calf every morning. So for the first hour, the pain was excruciating. Mm. But what happened is my feet would go numb. And I did that every single day for six months. That's how I got through my third hell week because I was so broken from the first two that the commander said, hey, the CEO said this is your last time we're sending you through. So that's how I got the idea to do that. So with the right, and, and people may listen to this and say, this guy is sadistic, he's crazy. He's No, if you know how I came up, you realize I was just a scared kid that found drive and passion to be something much better than what he thought he was. Trust me, it's okay. You might be called nigger one day. It's okay. You might be called some Jewish word or some faggot or gay word. It's okay. Let them call you that. What are you going to do now? They don't own your life. How are you going to control that now? How are you going to flip it upside down and say, Roger that, now I'm going to harness this shit and you'll read about me years from now? How? That's the question. How are you going to do that? Thicken your skin become more of a human being.
Don't be afraid of the reflection in the mirror because that's all you can be afraid of. But the biggest one is we're all, we, we are all great. No matter if, if you think you're dumb, no matter if you think you're fat, no matter if you are fat, no matter if you've been bullied, or no matter if you just got back from Iraq or Afghanistan and you have no legs or your arms or whatever, man, we all have greatness. It just, you gotta find the courage. You gotta find the courage to put your Bose headphones on and silence the noise out of this world. Once you overcome the reflection in the mirror, you've done it. <laughs>